Hi, and welcome back to Blockchain Fundamentals with Bill Laboon. Today, we're going to discuss cryptocurrency and anonymity. And specifically, I want to discuss what we really mean when we say that something can be anonymous uh, and what sort of technologies can help make uh, uh, blockchain transactions more anonymous and even why we would want to do so in the first place. So once again, uh, we will be using a Bitcoin as sort of the, the, the standard um, for uh, how we discuss how, this, how these are implemented. But I will mention a few other chains at the end of this and their approaches to anonymity. Uh, so it will not be entirely focused on Bitcoin. So the first thing we really should ask ourselves when we ask if something is anonymous is what do we mean by anonymous, uh, not to sound too uh, pedantic, and I realize I do sound a little bit like that. Uh, Greek, uh, if, uh, the word comes from the Greek and without an anoma name. So, if we mean by anonymity that you can use this, use Bitcoin without using your real name, then yes, it is anonymous. But if we mean no, you you have you can use no name at all. That's false. Uh, you will have some equivalent of your name, specifically your address. So, generally, when we speak of uh, using Bitcoin, we say that it is not anonymous, but rather pseudonymous. Uh, also from the Greek, just uh, using pseudus for false. So we have a false name. You know, it's very easy for you to create one or more identities on Bitcoin. You simply create a new address. And this creating an address is very simple. Uh, it can be done in a fraction of a second on any uh, modern computer. Uh, and so it's extremely simple also to have multiple identities. Uh, so you don't have to maintain uh, this the same identity, but you will always have to have some identity on the blockchain. And in some sense, your identity on the blockchain is more permanent than any identity that you use in, in real life. Uh, assuming that uh, Bitcoin continues to be used, then the, the blockchain will always exist, the Bitcoin blockchain. And so if the blockchain exists, all of the transactions and all of the identities uh, will continue to be on here and are trivial to look up. And if you consider this in terms of a transaction in real life, um, you know, perhaps if I go into a coffee shop uh, this morning, the, you know, when they write down your name uh, on, on the, the the cup to, to call out, you know, uh, Bill or, or Lil or Jill, since they often get my name wrong, uh, then yes, they, they know perhaps your true name there, but everybody is going to forget it. It's, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, already by now they have forgotten it. Uh, it's not written down anywhere but the cup, but on the blockchain, so even though you are using a pseudonym, uh, that, that data is around permanently. Which means that you can use, you know, people can use some uh, de-anonymous de-anonymization uh, techniques to match that pseudonym with your real life identity. So, when we talk about anonymity, we mean something stronger than Bitcoin's pseudonymity. Uh, a lot of people discovered, uh, to their chagrin. Uh, you know, in the early days, Bitcoin was really seen as anonymous money, and they discovered that, uh, in fact, no, it's in, anything on the blockchain is quite trackable. And so a lot of people who were using Bitcoin for um, uh, purposes that were against uh, the law of the country they were operating in uh, ended up finding out that uh, they actually could be tracked down. They were not really anonymous. So... From a technical perspective, when we talk about anonymity on the blockchain, we do mean a pseudonymous system. You should be able to use uh, new identities. But additionally, we are also looking for unlinkability. That means that these individual interactions should not be traceable to a single identity. So this is nothing more than what you would get uh, if you think about it with cash. 
uh, that if I get um, whatever fifty uh, one dollar bills and uh, I you know, use one dollar bill uh, to get a coke and then uh, a few days later I use some other uh, dollar bills uh, to to buy some candy. There is no one. There is no way for people to uh, track me down and say, "Wow, that Bill really has a sweet tooth since he is drinking soda and buying candy." They can't link those two transactions uh, together to get more information about me. Uh, which, you know, using uh, Bitcoin, uh, we, we have there's there are some difficulties with that because you're know, tracking. The reality, the state of the system, requires understanding every transaction really that that has occurred on it. So, why do we want anonymity besides making sure that people don't know how much candy that I buy? Well, first, you know, our, our first motivation, our our goal, really, if you look back to the Bitcoin white paper, is just to have like sort of the, the same like. Uh, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. We want to have at least the level of privacy you know, at a very minimum uh, that you use when using a credit card. So some others may have access to your transaction history, uh, but most people don't. Uh, if I use my credit card uh, to buy, uh, so I just, you know, uh, whatever, bought four boxes of cookies, uh, my bank may have some questions for me, perhaps. Maybe if I may, or maybe if I bought a thousand boxes of cookies, my bank may have questions for me. But you know, uh, my uh, my child can't see it and ask you know where the, you bought a thousand boxes of cookies. I should get at least twenty of those. Uh, my wife can't uh, see it and say why are you um, spending all of our money on cookies, etc. So this is like you know like a baseline level of privacy. Can we? While having everything out in the open on the blockchain, can we have like this, this, this small level of privacy? But ideally, we want this second uh, level of, of, of true anonymity and make it really you know, infeasible for anyone to track the participants in a transaction. So I want to go on a little uh, segue or a, a tangent here, I guess, that given enough um, you know, computing power and resources and time, uh, it's generally possible to, to remove uh, and de-anonymize uh, people's transactions. Uh, now, this, this amount of time may be infeasible. It may you know, take uh, as long as the end of the universe uh, in order to, to, to crack a, a code, but uh, there are what we would call side channel attacks. There are other ways to do this. If I mean, just to take an odd absurdum example, you know, imagine that everybody in the entire world is trying to break your privacy. Uh, they could be following you. Uh, they could be uh, sending in fake data into your, um, uh, your, 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 your computer. They could be replacing your computer when you get up. You know, just imagine a, an adversary with essentially unlimited power. They would probably be able to, to de-anonymize you. And so that's why we say it's computationally infeasible. So for the attack threats, for the threats that an ordinary person would face, or even perhaps someone who may be targeted um, by uh, you know, state or non-state actors, like, you know, like large uh, actors, you know, can we make it computationally infeasible to uh, uh, de-anonymize? And that brings us to a another question. Um, you know, what are the ethics of this? At first blush, one might think you know, anonymity is, is, is a good thing. Uh, at least in the United States and a lot of other places, I don't want you know, most people don't want their coworkers to know their salary. Um, if you're running a business, you don't want your competitors to know who your suppliers are, right? By seeing who you're paying on the blockchain, uh, or if you're being paid in Bitcoin, you're know, seeing how much your boss is paying you. Uh, you may want political privacy, so you may belong to a, um, a political party which is not uh, 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 approved of by the, the current system, and so you want to be able to send them uh, political contributions quietly without it being known. Or non-governmental organizations, if you uh, want to send money uh, to Greenpeace, for instance, um, or a contra some other contra you know, controversial um, uh, 
uh, NGO, then you may not want people to know about this. But on, on the other hand, uh, we can use anonymous currency in other ways. Uh, so uh, I don't want to get uh, too deep into whether or not these particular things uh, are ethical, but they're you know, certainly illegal. Um, and if you think uh, you know, unethical implies illegal or vice versa, well, uh, there you go. But you, you know, certainly we could use anonymous currency to do things that the vast majority of people would disapprove of, such as um, you know, like uh, ransomware um, or blackmail, uh, all of these uh, things that we then would have no real uh, backup to determine uh, or, or to, to uh, blacklist uh, these people if we have truly anonymous money. Of course, we already have that with cash, although that's you know, difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, on a high level, and there are some ways to de-anonymize cash, such as, as such as serial numbers. So there has been an idea, uh, and I, we've seen this in the United States uh, quite quite often, about sort of can, can we implement this technology so people can have the benefits of anonymity, but make sure that they only have anonymity as long as they are doing good things with it. Uh, so can we just uh, have like a, a a key that the police have and generally people have anonymity but if you have this police key then your your encryption could be broken it turns out that there's no real way to do this um, even if we uh, if we want to be decentralized we certainly can't have uh, parties that sort of a priori have have more power in the system such as in this case that the police uh, we'd have some central arbiter to determine the good and bad use cases. Uh, so there's an old saying uh, that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Uh, and I, I think this is the situation. If we want to have a decentralized system, uh, we can't say, you know, we can't have some subjective arbiter that would say that, oh, right, this is a person, well, they're obviously a terrorist and we should... Uh, break their encryption uh, versus oh no they're they're good they're fighting for their freedom against a tyrannical government uh, and so we should let them continue to use uh, in encrypted tools encryption tools so if you want to be decentralized you really you have to take the good with the bad and even from a technical level leaving that um, uh, you know like a possible key or a weakness in the encryption that means that that's something that a bad, you know, a quote unquote bad guy could potentially find. You know, in order to do this, you have to weaken the encryption. And I think it's really you know, key to, to realize that a good and a bad use case, just like our terrorist and freedom fighter example, they look the same from the point of view of the technology. From the point of view of Bitcoin, it doesn't know if you're um, buying alpaca wool slippers or you are uh, pay paying a ransom because someone infected your computers and, uh, and encrypted them. Uh, you know, the, and those computers, they didn't know that, that were infected. They didn't know if they were being uh, uh, you know, encrypted because we want to protect this, the data on it or if they're being used as part of a ransom attack. So if we want to have the benefits of encryption, uh, we are need, need to understand that uh, this, this, this goes both ways, right? The use of cryptocurrency goes both, both ways. And so it becomes a sort of personal, personal ethical question uh, what you do with it as opposed to a, a legal uh, question of what can be done with it. But I think there's no doubt that having uh, this information out there, right, especially in, in regards to strong encryption and cryptography, uh, weakens the power of the state in this particular uh, uh, realm. You know, being able uh, to communicate without being eavesdropped upon, well, this is you know, a real power of, of most state systems. And so by removing that or, or making it more difficult for them, uh, you know, this has you know, made some weakness uh, in there. And with Bitcoin, what I think is really interesting is that money is now a form of communication. It's, you can send value uh, in terms of communication. In the old days, uh, you know, 50 years ago uh, or, or 70 years ago, maybe, you couldn't send a group of numbers uh, 
over, uh, you know, call somebody up on the telephone or on, the, you know, make an announcement on the wireless and send some numbers and have people accept money. Now, obviously, there have been some centralized ways of doing that, like uh, credit cards, uh, where you could tell people your credit card number and, and buy something. But uh, this ability to communicate um, and, and do it in a sort of you know, stateless way, and, and not stateless in the computer science form of the word, but in the political science uh, form of the word, uh, has led to a, um, a, a movement uh, called crypto anarchy. Uh, so that, in, in, uh, I recommend you look into this. Uh, it's very important in the history of uh, the development of cryptocurrency. And uh, I think it, it, looking at, at the background uh, of where cryptocurrency comes from gives you a really good idea of where we are now. So the idea of crypto anarchy is that by having this, uh, this space that is really you know, free from uh, government overreach, uh, or reach, depends on your definition, uh, then you know, we can really develop, uh, the people doing that can develop their own, their, their own concept of a society outside of, uh, of the concept of, of a government. So it's very interesting. Um, I'll have the links uh, that you can uh, look up uh, on the, on the uh, uh, comments in, in the course. So is pseudonymity enough for us? So it, it may be, you uh, may be fine with just sort of that, remember that first level of privacy where perhaps state actors could track you down, um, but most people looking at the Bitcoin blockchain will not be able to tell uh, who owns what, what Bitcoin and what the transaction was spent upon. Um, however, uh, anyone who is interested in maintaining a sense of privacy uh, should realize your know, blockchain is public and if there's ever a place where your real identity is linked to an address you used Well now you have been very easily de-anonymized uh, and uh, You they can uh, then trace you know, where the Bitcoin uh, go There are a lot of different ways to do this and it turns out it is very difficult to avoid leaking information uh, about yourself So we'll talk about uh, some of these ways, but if you think about um, is how many times uh, that you have, you know, using a computer, you have given away uh, your, your information. And if that computer can be linked with a Bitcoin transaction, well, then there you go. There's a connection. Okay, so just to sort of summarize Bitcoin and the state of that, it's pseudonymous, not anonymous. And it op we're operating in this lecture on the assumption that anonymity so that pseudonymity plus unlinkability, not being able to, to link two transactions together, is good. Uh, it is trivial for anyone to follow transactions on the blockchain. They are uh, easily available. There are uh, tens of thousands of copies, if not more, of the Bitcoin blockchain, and it's very easy to uh, verify. Uh, but what we can do is make some steps to improve anonymity. So, how do we do that? In our ideal world of unlinkability, there's really three things that we want. So the same user, for the same user, it should be hard, you know, computationally difficult. Remember again, if you have the source of the, if you have the powers of the entire universe behind you, many of these things are possible. But we want to make it hard or computationally infeasible uh, to do these things. So it should be hard to link together different addresses of the same user. The same user should be able to have uh, multiple accounts and it's difficult uh, to link them all together. For the same user, it should be hard to link their transactions together and know that they're from the same user. And finally, it should be hard to link the sender of the payment to the recipient of the payment. So we should not be able to see that person X is sending and person Y is receiving. Uh, however, there are a lot of things we need to worry about um, in terms of avoiding the anonymization. Uh, so this uh, ideal world, this unlinkability, even if we had a blockchain that didn't provide a lot of this in information, there's constant leakage of your uh, uh, data in into the world. So these are not on-chain leakages of you know, like extra information being put on the blockchain, 
but simply by virtue of using uh, Bitcoin, you are leaking information. So for instance, if you go to pay with Bitcoin at a coffee shop, um, remember I said they forgot my name, but if they were a spy that, were, that was waiting for me, uh, then certainly they um, you know, recorded, okay, uh, we just saw a Bitcoin transaction come through to our address from this person, this, uh, and this person paid for it. We're, they're, we're the, he's the only one that they, we gave this address to. Well, now we know that Bill Laboon uh, has uh, some Bitcoin uh, at this particular address, and that can help de-anonymize me. Uh, analysis of usage times. So if I see that someone is very active from uh, 6 a.m. Uh, uh, U.S. Eastern Time to uh, uh, 4 p.m., for, for instance, well, it's very unlikely that uh, I'm, uh, I live in, in Japan or China. Uh, right, uh, you know, that I, or maybe that I'm just awake uh, at night all the time, but it's it's unlikely. Uh, reusing addresses, posting addresses, letting people know off chain what your address is. Anytime you do that, you're linking uh, yourself to to, uh, to it. But of course, you know, using Bitcoin, you need to say your your address. Um, perhaps uh, you know, if you made a vanity address, and remember we discussed these uh, in a previous lecture. You know, and maybe there's a special meaning behind it. So for instance, you'll remember the vanity address I made uh, was for CS1699, which was a class that I taught. So people could then see, all right, who's somebody that taught a class called CS1699? Uh, they see that a, a Bill Laboon uh, taught a class on this, which was also called Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Technology. Well, that gives them a good idea that, that it might be me. So these are just some examples. There's a lot of ways that uh, de-anonymization uh, can occur. So getting back uh, to our uh, uh, earlier slide uh, here, and so just after uh, saying that, that it's difficult, we want to have unlinkability. And while there are some uh, ways of avoiding one and two, uh, it turns out it's very difficult to avoid number three, uh, especially in an a, a, a entirely uh, transparent system like, like a Bitcoin-style blockchain. So what we can do, though, uh, is just hide the transaction in with a bunch of others. So we are going to need to say that you know, A is sending something and B is receiving it, but if there's 100 A's and 100 B's, well, we don't know where exactly it's going. Okay, so we know A is sending something, we know B is receiving something, but we don't know if B is receiving it from R or X or Z, and we don't know if A is sending it you know, to Q or L or J. Right? So what we are doing here is increasing the size of what we call the anonymity set. So this is the set of transactions that an adversary can't distinguish from your actual transaction. And the larger this is, the harder it's going to be to track down. So if your adversary knows, for instance, that you own address A, they're going to see that address A sent something, but they're not going to know where it, where it went to. Okay. And you could even use this you know, to send it back to yourself. You know, maybe you went to a second address is you, you know, A prime. Uh, so they, they may think you don't have any Bitcoins anymore, but you've really just sent them uh, to a different address. So uh, I like to think of this as the cicada strategy. So if you've never seen uh, cicadas, they uh, come out of the ground, at least uh, the, the, the broods near uh, Baltimore where, where I was living. Uh, see, I just leaked some information about myself there. Um, every 17 years. And cicadas are, they, they have no defenses, they have uh, no way of protecting themselves whatsoever. Uh, you know, uh, turtles catch them and eat them, they can't fly very well. Uh, but they are, there are millions of them, millions and millions and millions of them. And there's no way, they, and they all come out of the ground at once. It's actually a quite awe-inspiring sight. Uh, you know, over the course of, of, of a day or two, you know, these, these millions of, of insects come out of the ground and make it make a huge noise. So, sure, uh, there's you know, the, they don't have a lot of protections, but because there are just so many of them, uh, it's hard to find any particular one, 
right? And so, yeah, sure, lots get eaten, but lots also survive. Uh, so in this case, you know, uh, there's, there's no being eaten, but there is the fact that there's just so many that if you say, well, I'm looking for a particular cicada, you're never going, going to find it. Okay. So I want to um, you know, uh, say that the anonymity set is not one number. So different adversaries that are reviewing this may uh, have you know, more motivation or skills or different knowledge. Uh, they may know, for instance, that you know, X, Y, and Z addresses are already being used by someone else, so you know you're not sending to them, or maybe their address is X, Y, and Z. Um, so the, the anonymity set, uh, you know, we can have a good idea uh, of it, but depending on the adversary who's trying to de-anonymize you, uh, we, we, you can never know exactly uh, how much, uh, how large, excuse me, the anonymity set is. So what, in order to, to really calculate, or at least estimate, we need to figure out what does the adversary definitely know? You know what do they trivially know, trivially know just by looking at the blockchain? Uh, what does the adversary probably not know? All right, so uh, for, for instance, they may... Uh, they, they probably don't know uh, all of the, the users. If you have an anonymity set of 100 different um, addresses, they probably don't know the people behind all of them um, and what the adversary cannot know. So there are things that they cannot know, like, such as your, your, your private key, um, or at least you know, essentially cannot know. Again, if you've got millions of hidden uh, cameras in your room watching you all the time and uh, people are using Tempest equipment to spy on your monitor. Okay, perhaps in, in that case, there's nothing they truly cannot know. But again, generally, we're looking um, in terms of like what uh, the, the kind of adversary we're facing off against uh, can, can do. And we generally don't think that the entire world uh, is, is against us and involved in a, a vast Illuminati-like conspiracy. Okay, something else uh, that we can use uh, here, so besides um, uh, and something to avoid, is a taint analysis. So this is something that uh, was much bigger in the early days of Bitcoin. We don't see it as much because uh, we have realized uh, as a community to avoid address reuse if you're interested in uh, privacy. So uh, taint analysis asks, how related are two Bitcoin identities? So if we have some coins from S, and they always end up in R at some point, uh, so even if they happen to go through intermediaries, then they're going to have a high taint score. Uh, so we're looking just for uh, how uh, often are these uh, uh, different addresses involved in similar transactions. Okay? Do coins from one always end up in the other, or vice versa? Uh, so, if we, so if we see, for instance, that someone is uh, always buying uh, stuff from one supplier, or uh, perhaps this is one individual who is uh, storing uh, their, their Bitcoin in a cold wallet, and they occasionally send them out to a hot wallet, uh, th things like this. Uh, we can say that they're, they're tainted by each other. But again, most wallets nowadays uh, allow you to trivially uh, uh, create new addresses, so we don't see this as much of a big deal uh, anymore. But we can do, still do some linking. Uh, so for instance, if you remember uh, how you know, we have these, UT, uh, the, these, uh, these inputs and outputs from every transaction, and you know, for instance, I he see here that I have you know, coming from three different addresses, uh, Bitcoin all going to one uh, UTXO that's uh, 0.4 Bitcoin. Uh, well, there's th these input sub one, sub two, and sub three are probably linked. And if I know any information about those addresses, I might say oh, they're perhaps all Bill Laboon, uh, or perhaps they are um, like Bill and his roommates paying the, their their landlord uh, something like or so, something like that. So there's evidence that these are linked somehow, and we don't know. Like I said, we don't know um, exactly how just by looking at the data on chain. But if I have it on good authority that input sub one belongs to Bill and input sub three belongs to Bill from other analysis that I've done, then well now I'm going to be able to, uh, with high probability, 
think that input sub 2 is also uh, related to Bill Laboon, and perhaps I can see, all right, where did that come from? And do you know, more research there. And perhaps now uh, you know, the, the, the output, the transaction output, that may also have something to do with me. Uh, it's certainly someone that I've interacted with because I interact with them on chain, unless, of course, somebody stole all my private keys for those inputs. So we can see, you know, looking at this, once you start to get information uh, about someone, then you can get more and more by looking at what they have done on the blockchain. Um, a key thing uh, uh, here, some, so a way that you can avoid that, so in the previous um, example, we were uh, sending a transaction of 0.4 Bitcoin. Uh, and in this transaction, we're going to send, uh, we want to send 0.35 Bitcoin. So we have to send all those uh, inputs, right? We can't take a portion of an input. It has to be entirely spent. Um, and I'm going to send back this 0 0.05 Bitcoin to a new address, 18J, UTXO sub 1, uh, below. And there's no, and, and my, I will send the actual payment I'm making to one six c dot 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 utxo sub two uh, to that address. Well, there's uh, if I had sent back this this change address back to one of the previous addresses I've already used. Well, now I've just let people know one bit of information about this that it is in fact a change address. Um, here, there's no reason. I mean, it would be kind of silly. You'd be paying a little extra in fees to do this, uh, but you could uh, have the actual payment be that 0 0.05 Bitcoin, UTXO sub 1, and your change address be 0 0.35. Uh, or they could be uh, payments to two different people. So they may, they may not be any change address there. So again, one of the ways that we can help keep ourselves as anonymous as possible is not reusing addresses, not even for change addresses. Again, most wallets these days will let you do this automatically. So, yeah, so as I, I uh, uh, mentioned, we have an input here on smaller. There's never any way to know if Evil Bill here that sent this input, does he control both of those addresses? Is this just a way to throw people off his trail? Was he spending 0 0.08 Bitcoin to buy something and getting 0 0.02 and change? Or was he sending 0 0.02 Bitcoin to buy something and getting 0 0.08 and change? So really, if you get anything out of uh, this in terms of increasing your anonymity uh, on Bitcoin, it's avoid address reuse. And you will see this if you go to any site, really, that accepts Bitcoin uh, uh, for, for something, you, it will generate uh, an address for you to use. And that's not just for tracking purposes, although it's also very useful. If you know who is uh, sending you Bitcoin, then you can do something. Uh, and you know what address they're going to send it to, you can then do something uh, on that. But anytime uh, you are uh, going to be sending uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, hopefully it's not something like in the early days people would just post um, on a, a forum like you know, send me Bitcoin at this address and that address would never change. Nowadays uh, we always use different addresses. Address reuse is, is a terrible thing. And uh, if you're worried about running out of space, uh, there are more addresses, out, possible addresses out there than anyone could possibly use. Uh, and with modern wallets, again, it handles all of this, so you don't have to worry about you know, ease of use or anything. It just all happens automatically. So don't reuse addresses. So from the earliest days of Bitcoin, people have wanted to try to de-anonymize uh, uh, those using uh, the system. And what they did, they came up, uh, some of these early... Uh, you know, Bitcoin de-anonymizers in 2010 and 2011, uh, in, in uh, you know, the early days, uh, they came up with some idioms of use. That is, how do people use Bitcoin? So we've already mentioned some of these, like shared spending implies a single identity, and uh, that change addresses tend to be fresh addresses. Uh, so these you know, new uh, addresses that pop up, they tend to be uh, change uh, uh, addresses. Um, I recommend you look through uh, some of these papers on um, how 
uh, this uh, de-anonymization happened in the early days, even though much of it, uh, again, we have uh, discovered some, some ways around it. And um, I, I would say, I wouldn't say they're out of date per se, but they certainly um, are looking at an earlier uh, version of Bitcoin than the idioms of use that we have today. But something, again, that still is useful and that they, they, they mention, if you can link even part of a cluster of transactions to some real-world identity, well, now you have more information both about that cluster and about the identity. You know, so that real-world identity, well, if you can find out that, all right, Bill Laboon used some Bitcoin here, so not only did I discover information about this Bitcoin that belongs to Bill Laboon, but I've discovered some information about Bill Laboon. Uh, perhaps I can see when he first started using Bitcoin or how much Bitcoin he has, how, what he does with it. Um, so there are a lot of, of different ways, right? Again, I've already mentioned that um, uh, you're buying a coffee. I'm you know, letting people know if I buy it with Bitcoin, you know, who I am. I'm going to have to uh, interface from a particular address uh, with them to send uh, to send uh, the, 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 the Bitcoin, uh, perhaps via service providers. So this isn't just like you know, buying something online, but perhaps even you know, your internet service provider, you know, you're sending information uh, about Bitcoin, perhaps they can uh, uh, capture information about that. Or even just carelessness, like accidentally copying and pasting your address, or uh, even keeping it in um, uh, uh, your, your, your buffer, your copy-paste buffer, you know, that's something that a lot of, uh, like that certain uh, JavaScript uh, can read, what's in your buffer even before you paste it. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to, to, to link this. And as researchers discover better de-anonymization techniques, and the, the data is going to remain on the Bitcoin network for essentially all time, uh, anonymiz anonymization tends to get worse over time. So it's sort of a constant... Uh, battle where we're trying to come up with new features to anonymize and different uh, techniques to do so and researchers just also discover better ways to de-anonymize. So this is from the CycleJohn paper um, where there, there we could see actually and determine just based on uh, how Bitcoin moved and even you know, like by sending perhaps Bitcoin and seeing what happened to it, tracing it, um, where uh, uh, Bitcoin were, were ending up and how these uh, different systems um, were related to each other and how they interacted with each other. And you could see things like uh, Satoshi Dice and Silk Road, uh, My Bitcoin, Bitcoin E, early uh, uh, um, uh, exchange, uh, InstaWallet, Mt. Gox, another exchange. And we could see you know, the, uh, how uh, this all interacted with each other. And once you have that, well, if I know that a certain cluster of Bitcoin or addresses uh, were linked, for instance, to uh, Silk Road, and I'm interested in uh, going after uh, people that use Silk Road, well, I can find their uh, Bitcoin addresses and de-anonymize them, and now I have um, a good idea of who's using Silk, who is using Silk Road. So aside from uh, looking at the chain or looking in person at as ways to de-anonymize, we also can use the Bitcoin network itself. So what I mean by this is looking at things at, at the network, uh, watching data go from Bitcoin node to Bitcoin node and track down where it came from. Um, so there's a link uh, to a paper on originally uh, how this was done, which, which is very interesting. Uh, we don't think about the nodes as leaking data. But if we have, if this is you know, a sort of simplified expression of, a, uh, of the Bitcoin network, and we have some spies on it, well, uh, it, it's kind of like triangulating where an earthquake came from. All right, so here we have the four red nodes that are acting as spies, and the blue node issues a transaction. Uh, it's going to gossip amongst uh, all the nodes to which it is connected, and you can see it actually is connected to several of our spies. And uh, according to Kaminsky, the first node that informs you of a transaction is probably the source of it. But even if it's not, um, if we have a good idea of the topology of the network, we can get a better idea of where it came from. So for instance, if our nodes in the United States uh, all see a transaction 
uh, first, and our nodes in uh, Europe and China and Africa all see it later, well, we have a good idea that that transaction probably originated somewhere in the US, uh, as opposed uh, to, you know, uh, to Africa. So in order to avoid this sort of uh, level of uh, de-anonymization, uh, you would have to hide your IP. So there are some ways, like using Tor or similar services. Uh, however, that can be blocked. Uh, it's also it's very slow. It's not very well suited to running on the Bitcoin network. Uh, there's you know, because Tor uh, sends data over over several hops. It actually uh, might be too slow for using. It's not uh, very easy. Uh, but there are some other um, uh, ways to avoid it. Uh, one interesting um, uh, protocol is uh, Dandelion, uh, which was um, uh, covered in, in, uh, by, in a paper by uh, Dr. Julia Fonti from CMU and, and some others, that uh, basically, just like a dandelion, uh, if you think about a dandelion, has a stem and then a, a puff ball uh, at the end after it's, um, you know, when it's reached the end of life, it's got this puff ball at the end that's going to sprout out. So similarly, whenever you issue a transaction, it will randomly send it from node to node. Uh, so if we look back here, uh, maybe it sends it from this node to this node to this node to this node, just one by one. So it never uh, moves, uh, it doesn't gossip, it just sends privately to, to the next node. And then this black node that, that's highlighted uh, is actually going to be the one that spreads it and gossips it. So for all intents and purposes, for the rest of the network's perspective, the transaction is coming from this node and not the actual originating node. Uh, so that's you know, another way of uh, providing uh, some, some additional anonym anonymity uh, on Bitcoin. Uh, you could do offline or off-chain transfers. Uh, so these are a little bit more uh, in-depth, but they are possible. Uh, OpenDime, I think, is a very interesting um, way of doing this. Uh, it's actually a, a USB or the equivalent of like a USB stick. Uh, however, the, uh, the private key is hidden uh, inside of it. And if the, the Bitcoin is, uh, uh, you know, if you ever actually go to, to spend it and not just uh, store it, uh, you'll have to uh, basically you know, make, make an indication that that's happening. So it will actually be you know, physically like, you know, uh, broken or like a, in other ways, maybe a light would shine or something so that uh, you would know that this has in fact been, been used. Uh, and no one can, it's not just like, you know, copying down a private key to somebody. You give these pers this person an open dime, they are able to verify that there are Bitcoin on it and how much. And then you also can uh, send uh, that data, uh, you know, that Bitcoin on by like, using up uh, the open dime. So another way to improve anonymity uh, is by using mixers. Uh, so if we think back to improving anonymity, uh, we talked about improving the anonymity set, you know, making that larger. So exchanges could be good for this, but they often have their own you know, know your customer or other requirements that, that hurt your privacy. So there are some dedicated mixing services. So basically what we're doing is we're just making this uh, a larger anonymity set. We're going to all put in uh, our coins and people are all going to take the, them out. Uh, however, uh, there can be some problems here. So if I want to have, I've got my, uh, my green avatar here has 0.3 Bitcoin, my furry avatar here has 0 0.02, and my uh, red-hatted, uh, red-napkined uh, avatar has 0.7 Bitcoin. So I send them all into this mixer, and the mixer uh, sends the 0.7 to some other address, which is controlled by uh, the red-hatted, person uh, 0.3 to the green uh, and 0 0.02 to the, the, the furry one. Well, what's the problem with this? It's, it's trivial for anyone looking at this transaction to determine uh, who actually owns the, the, the Bitcoin, right? Because if I send in 0 0.7 and I receive 0 0.7, well, it's not gonna be hard for people to figure out. I didn't send in 0 0.7 just to get back 0 0.02. And uh, uh, yeah, I didn't send in 0.7. 0.02 and think that I'd get back 0.07. So 
So what you'll see uh, with mixers is they'll have a, a set chunk size. So for instance, this mixer has a 0.1 Bitcoin chunk size. If you want to uh, set, send in send in Bitcoin, then you're going to have to put it in, in chunks of 0.1 uh, Bitcoin. So that way, anyone looking at this, they're not going to be able to tell who the, the transaction uh, went to because it's just 0.1 Bitcoin in, 0.1 Bitcoin out. Um, and in case you're curious how uh, many modern mixers actually make money since they, they uh, just you know, keep this, the same uh, amount here, is that uh, a random 1% or 2% uh, of, of all the outputs uh, will be sent to addresses that they control and not uh, ones that you, you control. So it's basically it's like paying a 1% fee or 2% fee. If you have more uh, Bitcoin than the, the, the chunk size, you can just send in multiple chunks. So here, uh, the red-hatted uh, bill had two, uh, 0.2 Bitcoin and passes it in as two separate 0.1 Bitcoin uh, transactions and gets it, gets it out here as two separate 0.1 uh, Bitcoin addresses, uh, uh, outputs in two different addresses. And of course, you can do this uh, over and over again. So Jacket Bill here uh, does a mix and sends it through another mixer and sends it through another mixer. And so each time we're increasing the anonymity set you know, of the other, the pink arrows uh, that are coming in uh, through it. But of course, there are downsides uh, with using a mixer. Uh, first, you're going to need to trust them with your Bitcoin. And because of that, there have been many, many, many many, many, many scams out there where uh, a mixer gets set up and then people send a Bitcoin to it and it works fine for a while and then one day they just keep all the Bitcoin and run away and there's no way to do anything uh, about it. Um, you, know, you also run the risk that someone looking at the history of your Bitcoin are going, is going to say, well, you used a mixer or you got this from a mixer uh, and so, you know, your, your token is in some sense marked. It's, it's dirty. Okay. Um, you are going to need to have a large number of people using the same mixer if you want a true uh, an, a large anonymity set. Uh, you may see some mixers that you know, act or, you know, they, they, they advertise that they have a lot of um, members, a lot of people using it, rather. Uh, however, they could just be washing, you know, their own Bitcoin multiple times through which isn't really increasing your anonymity uh, very much. You know, if they have, uh, if we see that there have been 50 transactions, uh, excuse me, 50 addresses sending in 0.1 Bitcoin, but you, you also see that the same addresses are just using it over and over again, that the Bitcoin goes to address A, that goes to, to, to ad, ad, address B, um, but all of these are just, you know, they could all just, this all could just be sort of a Sybil attack, right? Or equivalent to Sybil attack is the wrong word, a Sybil scam uh, that makes you think that the anonymity is much higher than it actually is. Um, and it turns out that uh, mixers don't always follow best practices. You know, it, it is hard uh, to do in a correct way. And also it's not exactly a field where uh, people are, are discussing best practices and getting audited and being registered with the government. Uh, Etc. And so it turns out uh, there are other ways of de-anonymizing those who use mixers. So with all this, th these issues, there is uh, something uh, like uh, a mixer that exists that is is used uh, called a coin join. Uh, so coin join is interesting. It's like single transaction mixing. So you don't have to uh, uh, worry about having. Uh, you know, someone else have control uh, of, of your Bitcoin. Uh, so the idea is you find other peers who want to mix, and this would be done generally done in an off-chain uh, manner, uh, exchange input-output addresses, and create a transaction with all of these, uh, all of these around it. Right? So you have one really large transaction that sends in a lot of data, excuse me, a lot of uh, uh, transactions from different addresses and makes one really big transaction out of it. So this kind of hurts uh, those that are looking to do link analysis, right? Remember we said that generally if uh, data is coming from a transaction, is all included in one transaction, multiple addresses, they are somehow linked. And we are, we are, we are you know, going against that. We're just sort of randomly finding other peers uh, that want to develop this transaction together. Our, our 
we weren't linked to them before. Uh, now we're going to send this transaction around and each peer signs after making sure that their specific output is present. So we've created this transaction, everyone verifies it and everyone signs it and then the transaction is broadcast. So basically what we're doing is just making one huge uh, transaction with lots of different people uh, with outputs instead of just you know, a single, uh, all these single transactions that would be harder, uh, excuse me, easier uh, to track down. But there are some problems with CoinJoin. Um, it's vulnerable to denial of service attacks because someone could, especially with these larger uh, coin joins, could decide not to uh, sign uh, you know, midway through. And so it's hard to defend against bad actors in any sort of decentralized uh, way. So there are um, attempts to do this, but uh, uh, it is something that if someone really wanted to attack, they, they, they certainly could by just simply becoming a bad actor uh, in, the, in these systems. And with poor implementation, you can leak more data uh, about yourself uh, uh, using this. So those are some of the ways that uh, Bitcoin is trying to, uh, and, and the Bitcoin ecosystem is trying to improve uh, uh, anonymity. Uh, however, because you know, Bitcoin, as I've mentioned, it's a very secure, but also very conservative protocol. Um, there are some other uh, coins and blockchains out there that are using different methods uh, to focus on privacy. Um, so some of the more famous ones uh, out there are Zcash, which use uh, ZK snarks, uh, which are uh, uh, zero knowledge uh, uh, proofs. Uh, which they, Zcash and some other systems have this as well, uh, an interesting idea of anonymity by choice. So you can sort of sign up uh, for anonymity uh, or, or not. Uh, Monero, which does not have anonymity by choice, simply using it, you uh, are taking advantage uh, of all their anonymity, um, have some really cool features like ring signatures and stealth addresses uh, so that you know, your address can actually be uh, different each time, uh, generated uh, anew. Uh, Grin and Beam uh, both use the Mimblewimble protocol, which not only is much more private, but also uh, much more scalable and transactions are really of a very uh, different type uh, than what we think of with a, a Bitcoin style uh, transaction. It allows for like really uh, incredible uh, scaling. And we also see uh, privacy enhancements that are being um, uh, not part of the protocol, but rather that move uh, on, top, on top of the protocol, uh, implemented on top of the protocol. So there are several uh, Bitcoin wallets that will allow you to uh, do an automatic coin join. Uh, Tornado.cash is really interesting. It's on Ethereum uh, where you submit your Ether to a big pot and then you have proof that you can withdraw an equivalent amount at some other uh, time in the future. Um, Aztec is a privacy engine for Ethereum that allows you to obscure uh, what, uh, what addresses are actually inputting and outputting um, uh, or, or the input and output uh, addresses for a transaction. So this is a really uh, big space and there is a lot of work being done right now on improving anonymity and I've really just scratched the surface. So if this at all interests you, uh, I would recommend reading some of the papers uh, that, I, that I've linked and uh, looking into all of the uh, different privacy uh, features that are being added and the different functionality uh, because this is a, a very exciting field right now in blockchain.